Hey, I'm Tracy Burns with The Street. Here with us right now, Ken Doctor, contributing columnist, author of Newsonomics. And man, you're making some noise out there with the columns you're writing lately, Ken. Thanks for being here. Hey, you're quite welcome. There's just a lot of news. There's a lot of news, and I suppose you could thank our president for a lot of it, right? So the president actually is helping our business in spades, isn't he? It, it is an amazing thing. Uh, first, right, uh, actually in the run-up to the election, but right in the immediate aftermath, I wrote a bunch about the Trump bump. And the Trump bump was a real thing of uh, subscriptions uh, hitting uh, unpredictable un, un, uh, levels uh, at a number of publications. And the question was how long that would last. And now I've called it the subscription surge because we've seen it. We're into uh, April already, and uh, subscriptions are still up over what they were a year ago at about a half a dozen high-quality national outlets. It's amazing, actually, especially when you and I both know our business was dying. The president, in the midst of the election, hammered half of our fellow brethren out there, right? <laughs> Destroyed them as fake news. And now, to your point... We have the New York Times passed 3 million subscriptions. The New Yorker subscriptions up 230% versus same time three months ago. This is all based on your reporting. The Atlantic is up. And now Vanity Fair. Why? Why? What's happening? So uh, it could be a Trump plan. It could be make the uh, American news media great again. But we don't <laughs> know if it's that strategic. Uh, what's really happened, if you look at each of these companies that you just named, uh, they have had successful paywalls, meaning that they allow readers to sample, usually six or ten articles a month, but then they, they make people pay if they want to read regularly. And they had developed successful businesses over the last two to five years. And then having this business ready, having the technology ready, and there's a lot of technology and messaging and marketing smarts that go into it, Trump comes along and paints the news media as the enemy, and they have greatly benefited from it. So it's important to see that, that, that there was a uh, precedent for it, that he helped goose the numbers up. The numbers are still up. But what I think is most important, when I wrote about uh, Vanity Fair joining The New Yorker at, at Condé Nast uh, in the uh, paywall parade, is that these publications almost uniformly are ones that have increased their national reporting and are seen as reality checks on Donald Trump. And readers are, have just flocked to the, these publications and said, we need a reality check. And even in this era of fake news, where we have, there's practically the whole fake news industry at this point, right. um, people say, I trust this publication. I trust the New Yorker. I trust the Washington Post. I trust the New York Times. And the logical thing in the business world is when you trust something, you pay for it. But it, what's interesting is most of the publications you mentioned lean left. So interesting that people are trusting organizations that don't truly support the president. Well, absolutely. It, uh, remember that there were, there were more popular votes against Trump than there were yeah, for him. True. And if you look at paywall economics, and this is something that, that people have a hard time with. They had a hard time back when the New York Times launched its paywall and announced it in 2010. I remember having uh, interviews with reporters then as an analyst. And I would say if they can get 3% of all of their digital audience in the United States to subscribe, they'll have a thriving subscription business and they will have crossed over to the digital world. They are now at about 2 plus percent. So in this world, and it's, and it's, counter, it's kind of counterintuitive, if you can get 1, 2, 3% of your digital audience to pay, you can make a quite a business a lot as long, of course, as that national digital audience is big. And that's why this is working for national publications like The New Yorker and The Washington Post and The Times and not working as well for local publications. People should know that your article went up on April 17th about Vanity Fair and the other um, publications, so they should check it out. OK, but let's play now devil's advocate here. What happens if people well, we get bored of it. I mean, we're slowly getting bored of the daily tweets from the president, right? What happens if everyone loses its interest? What happens to the subscription model then? Well, the subscription model, importantly, for all the publications we've named, was successful 
before Donald Trump got elected. It has simply been goosed and goosed by, by a large number. The, the thing that we have learned, and it's about five to eight years of learning now about how digital subscriptions work, is what do we do as consumers? We give our credit card over, and it's on an auto renew. And so the churn rate is relatively low. If a news medium continues a trusted relationship with its audience, we've seen very low churn. So that is the number to watch, especially for all this, these uh, Trump bump subscribers over the next year. Do we have a higher rate of churn? And already we're seeing it slow down. But I would think that even if uh, there is another major change at the top, I don't think these numbers are going to go down at all. They may just slow. But then again, we have no idea what the next step of history is going to be. Right. And it seems like sky's the limit with this administration. So I suppose to your point, subscription or churn rates might be lower than uh, than people are hoping. Let's well, talk. I remember that Mark Thompson, the CEO of The New York Times, uh, he dropped into a conversation at the UBS conference in I think it was in November that his new goal is 10 million subscribers. They have three million now between print and digital. It's 10 million. So we're just at the beginning of digital subscriptions. And you think of this world and how it's changed from music subscriptions and movie subscriptions and TV subscriptions uh, among all the companies that are out there. This could be, be the beginning of something, but it's that trusted relationship between a news medium and the audience. Yes, you're absolutely right. And I suppose, you know, God forbid there's an impeachment trial. That's not going to hurt. All right, let's talk about Univision because you now have a new piece going up on the site about Univision's purchase of Gawker, which happened back in August, $135 million. What was the rationale to begin with with that purchase? It was, I thought it was an interesting story and it turned out to be a fascinating story. <laughs> Where, as we know, we have the whole Hulk Hogan mess and, it, right. and, and, and we, we all covered it. Um, and then all of a sudden Gawker becomes toxic. And the question is, well, who would want to buy this thing that's been in, in lawsuit and, and what are the legal implications and what's going on here? It turned out that uh, Univision and Ziff Davis, we think were the last two uh, bidders for it. Univision got it. And I talked in depth with Univision executives about it. And they said that they were interested in it because they thought it had some interesting aspects to it. But the one jewel they found in it that they hadn't expected was the e-commerce. Mm. So Nick Denton, the founder of, of Gawker, had gotten some press for his e-commerce because he had done a lot more of it than others. And Gizmodo and their, and their other five sites sell stuff. And, well, we're hearing numbers like they're selling a lot of stuff and they're making a fair amount of profit. And, in fact, that had helped turn the company around before the lawsuit. Well, it turns out that Univision, in doing its due diligence, saw that the e-commerce was more than a quarter of the business of Gawker and that it was a pretty profitable business and they really liked the look of it. And looking as everybody in the news publishing business is doing for alternative revenue streams, they said, this is really interesting, number one. And number two, we can scale this. We're Univision. We've got the number five broadcaster in the country. Uh, we sell stuff on air. We don't sell anything online. So this is an e-commerce story of the return of e-commerce in the publishing world. And this was tried 10 and 15 years ago, but now it's coming back. And we're also seeing BuzzFeed, Vox, and the New York Times, as well as Business Insider, make some significant investments in e-commerce. CEO of Gizmodo saying a third of his total revenue comes from e-commerce. I, so I, I understand what you're saying. This is not new though, right? Affiliate business has been tried before. It hasn't right. been successful for a lot of companies along the way. What's gonna make this work for them? Well, it, it, it's interesting. They've got this slogan and uh, it's part hype, I think, but there's part <laughs> reality to it, which is um, trust, truth, transaction, three T's. So they have sites, the sites they bought, they, they retired Gawker where they, they never bought because they did not buy Gawker.com. It, uh, it bought the others, Jezebel and uh, Lifehacker and Gizmodo and the others. Um, and what they, had, what they knew is that a lot of these sites were a decade old or, 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 or almost that, and that they had really developed a trusty and trusting readership. 
And using that trust, those readers believe that the journalism they're seeing is truthful. It's the right take. It's often it was often pretty casual, but it seemed to, to hold no prisoners. So they they trusted it. They thought it was truthful, and that made them more willing to transact. The I think the secret sauce of what uh, what Univision was able to buy from uh, the old Gawker was how they created the deals. They actually created deals. They have a set, separate staff, which is four editors separate from the news, news uh, the newsroom who create offers and they will look for the best products. They will disclose up at the top there that uh, the sites are making money off it if you buy, but they're saying these are the best and here's the deal and they're writing it in a way that is engaging to read. So each site has maybe three or four offers a day. Well, it is, it is read unto itself and then all of these deals are aggregated at kinjadeals.com. So they're seeing really interesting sell-through. They're saying conversion rates, once somebody actually gets to an offer page, of uh, as high as 16%, which is really high. That's really high. Really so high. if you do a lot of volume, if you have that big audience, if they trust you, you present the offers in the right way, they have a money machine going. Now, a lot of questions here. Amazon is changing its affiliate rates overall, consternation uh, in, in that community. But it's not changing them yet for the big suppliers of commerce like like a uh, Gizmodo or Univision. Well, I tell you, this is a fabulous ongoing story that I know you are going to continue to cover. Cover Ken's story will be up on our site soon. Check it out. Ken, you are a wealth of knowledge. Thank you for taking the time to be with us today.